Today we're going to be taking a look at five different photos that seem completely normal on the surface. That is, until you learn that each of these photos was taken moments before disaster. I'm going to be sharing the stories of people who had their last photograph taken while they were hiking. And the strange thing is that multiple of these photos were taken without the person ever knowing that they were even on camera. So to start off, we're gonna look at one of these disturbing photos and I'm gonna show you these photos completely free of charge, but the only catch is you have to hit that subscribe button and please help us get to our goal of 1 million subscribers, especially if you're a repeat viewer. I think that's a pretty fair deal, but that's just me. Now, those of you that watch my videos on the regular probably know that I'm not great at pronouncing things. And I'm just gonna say there's a lot of difficult names in this video. I always try my best. I'm, I'm gonna try my best in this video too, obviously. I even have notes which on pronunciation, which I have for literally every video. I'm probably still gonna get them wrong, but just know I I'm trying. Ali Nadari disappeared on August 23rd, 2020 in British Columbia, Canada. On that day, Nadari was hiking Eagle Mountain, which is a very popular spot due to its accessible location on the outskirts of the Vancouver suburbs. There are numerous hiking, mountain biking, and even horseback riding trails on Eagle Mountain. Now, it is still wilderness after all, but my understanding is that as far as wilderness goes, Eagle Mountain would be on the less remote side of the spectrum, which makes this photo here all the more disturbing. 52 year old Ollie Nadari had hiked Eagle Mountain numerous times. I even heard reports that he would do it almost every day. So he obviously would have been very familiar with the area and the terrain. But on August 23rd, 2020, something went horribly wrong because Nadari set off into the woods, but never returned to his car. The trailhead that he parked at was actually close to some houses, and one of the neighbors noticed that his car was still parked on the night that he disappeared. This led to him being reported missing quite quickly, which was a positive early break in the case. And searchers got another break on the second day of the search when they recovered a photo of Nadari taken on the day that he disappeared. It was taken on a motion activated trail camera and it shows Nadari just hiking on up the trail the same way that he had done numerous times before. I'm not sure who owned the camera. I couldn't find that piece of information or why it was placed on a hiking trail for that matter. But regardless, this photo was very important to the investigation. It placed Nadari in an exact spot at an exact time, which allowed investigators to narrow down the area that they needed to search. However, Instead of being the lucky break that would go on to bring the dairy home alive, the photo would eventually go on to be a disturbing glimpse into what was likely the man's last day. The search dragged on for a full week and hundreds of volunteers used drones, dogs, helicopters, and more to search for Nadari. The searchers reportedly covered some 48,000 square meters of trail, but other than the mysterious trail cam photo, no sign of Nadari was ever found. And after a week, the search was called off. This is such a bizarre story to me. I mean, the man was hiking in a familiar and well-traveled area. There's photographic evidence placing him on the trail at a certain time. And it was also the summer when the weather was mild. I don't know, it's just, really weird. They say that foul play was never really suspected, at least according to all the news articles I read, and there aren't really any theories about what happened. It seems like after this photo was taken, Nadari simply just vanished. My heart goes out to his family and friends, and I hope that someday they get answers about what happened. In an effort to prevent future tragedies and keep everybody safe, I always try to extract lessons and takeaways from the stories that I cover. But with that said, sometimes there are no clear lessons and unfortunately that kind of seems to be the case for me when it comes to Nadari's disappearance. It's just so random and I don't know what could have been done to prevent it. Leave a comment if you have any thoughts on this. That is not the case for this next story. However, there is a clear lesson to be learned here that I think will help keep us all safe when hiking in the heat. And it's for that reason that I'd like to thank our sponsor Aura for making this video and thus these lessons possible in the first place and also for keeping me safe online. So I have a challenge 
challenge for you. I want you to go to Google right now and type in your first and last name. Now, when you do this, chances are you're gonna be pretty surprised or even shocked to see that your full legal name, home address, phone number, and tons of other personal information is publicly available on the internet for anybody to see. This is something that's a really big deal to me personally, because as a YouTuber, the last thing I want is some crazy troll finding my phone number and calling me at all hours of the day and night. But if you think that's only an issue for someone in the public eye, that's not true. Scammers and spammers use this information to target you as well. Have you ever wondered why you get so many spam phone calls? This is where today's sponsor, Aura, comes in. They can identify the data brokers who sell your information publicly and submit takedown requests, which the these data brokers are legally obligated to comply with. In other words, Aura will get your private information off of these scummy websites. But that's not all that Aura can do. In fact, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Aura provides you with a VPN, an antivirus, a password manager, identity theft insurance, and much, much more. Normally, if you wanted all of those things, you'd have to buy them individually from different companies. It would just be a huge headache, but with Aura, all you have to do is install the one app and you get all of that stuff for one affordable price. Aura is basically a one-stop shop for all things related to your online security and identity protection. And when you go to aura.com slash kylehateshiking or click the link at the top of the description, you're gonna get yourself a free 14-day trial. So you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your information, or one more time, go to aura.com slash kylehateshiking, go get that free trial. You'll also be massively supporting the channel when you click or buy through that link. So thank you very much, Aura. And now on to our next story. For this one, we're gonna head to an area that is unfortunately aptly named Death Valley. California's Death Valley National Park is largely considered to be one of, if not the hottest place on the entire earth. On a summer day in 1913, a temperature of 134 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded at Furnace Creek, which my understanding is still the hottest temperature ever recorded on the surface of the earth, even to this day. Those who hike in Death Valley, particularly in the summer, have to be extremely careful to avoid fatal consequences. Undeterred by the name of the park, Los Angeles resident Steve Curry became fixated on the idea of hiking in Death Valley during the summer of 2023. According to his wife, he had talked about visiting Death Valley for more than a week, despite his wife warning him about the dangerous temperatures. She was unable to talk him out of it. And so on Tuesday, July 18th, 2023, the 71-year-old man headed into the heat. Steve Curry had been adventuring in the outdoors for years, so this is not the case of an inexperienced hiker making an uninformed choice. Unfortunately though, there's little that experience can do to protect you from 100 plus degree temperatures as Steve would tragically find out. Steve Curry's objective was to start at the Golden Canyon Trailhead, then hike to Zabriskie Point, and then return from there to his car. He started in the morning, but temperatures were already rising at this point dangerously fast. By the time he made it halfway through his hike, it was clear that the man was struggling. When Steve arrived at Zabriskie Point, he huddled up underneath a metal sign, which provided the only slither of shade in the area. There just so happened to be a reporter with the Los Angeles Times at Zabriskie Point, and the reporter actually photographed and interviewed Steve. He was asked why he was out hiking in such insufferable heat, to which he responded, why not? People around him had supposedly offered to help Steve, but he refused all of them. It seemed like he was determined to finish the hike under his own power, a respectable but also tragic stubbornness that would ultimately lead to his death. This would happen just shortly after these photographs were taken. I think these images are incredibly disturbing. This one in particular really gets to me. You can tell that he's just suffering and he probably should have given up then, but 
he didn't. Eventually, Steve left the tiny shaded spot underneath the sign and hiked back out into the heat. The photos that the reporter took would end up being the last photos of Steve Curry. He trudged through the desert and did somehow manage to make it all the way back to his car at the trailhead. But once Steve arrived, completing his hike, by the way, he collapsed onto the ground outside of a restroom. It was 3.40 in the afternoon and it was over 121 degrees Fahrenheit outside. A witness called 911 and park rangers arrived on scene within seven minutes. They administered CPR and they even used an automated external defibrillator but were unable to save Steve. It was so hot outside that they weren't even able to call in a medical helicopter because the air was far too thin for it to take off safely. My heart goes out to Steve Curry, his wife, and all of his friends and family. And look, I'm not trying to victim blame here. I never am in these videos, but I do think it's fair to say that Steve made a bad choice to hike in the extreme heat that day. I've never hiked when it was that hot outside, but I have had a few 95 to 100 degree days on trail. It's not fun and it's extremely dangerous. So please remember this story next time you're prepared to just shrug off the heat index before a hike. May Steve Curry rest in peace. If you're afraid of heights, then you might want to skip this next story. But if you know somebody who's put themselves in a risky position just to take a photo, you know, standing on the edge of cliffs and stuff like that, then you might want to share this story with them because in researching for this video, I've discovered that taking photos and selfies when you're hiking is a lot more dangerous than one might think. Also, this is one of the stories where I'm gonna have a hard time with the names, but I'm doing my best. Vishnu Viswanath and Meenakshi Morathi were a young married couple originally from India. By 2018, they had moved to the United States for work and also to travel around and document the country's incredible scenery. Naturally, that meant visiting lots of national parks and taking lots of photos. In March of 2018, the couple visited the Grand Canyon in Arizona and posted this photo to their Instagram. Parts of the caption read, quote, a lot of us, including yours truly, is a fan of daredevilly attempts of standing at the edge of cliffs and skyscrapers. But did you know that wind gusts can be fatal? Is our life just worth one photo? This Instagram post didn't stand out that much at first, but in time, it would later prove to be tragically ironic. Later that year, in October of 2018, couple decided to visit Yosemite National Park in California, and they made the short trek to a popular spot known as Taft Point. Taft Point has a ledge that hikers can walk right up to. There's no railing, and there's tons of photos online of people standing at this ledge, highlighting its massive drop-off. Now, I'll admit, these photos are beautiful, and they're definitely scenic, but they're also incredible incredibly dangerous. When Viswanath and Morathi arrived at Taft Point, they were not alone. Again, this is a very popular spot and there were reportedly around a dozen other hikers in the area at the time. There was another young couple at the Overlook who noticed and specifically remembered seeing Morathi partially due to her bright pink hair and partially due to the fact that she was standing dangerously close to the edge of the cliff. Sean Madison was quoted saying, she gave me the willies. There aren't any railings. I was not about to get that close to the edge. Madison and his girlfriend snapped a few selfies and then they hiked back to their cars. Viswanath and Morathi stayed behind, eventually setting up their camera on a tripod in an attempt to take a photo from the edge of the cliff. The next morning, hikers discovered an eerie scene when they arrived at Taft Point. There was a tripod and camera situated near the edge of the cliff, but nobody was around using it. This was reported to the authorities and it didn't take long before the bodies of Viswanath and Morathi were found at the bottom of the cliff. The couple had apparently fallen off the edge while trying to take a photo, a tragic death, and one that had come only a few months after they had posted their warning on Instagram 
from the Grand Canyon. This wasn't the end of the story, however. Upon investigating, it was determined that both Viswanath and Morthy had alcohol in their systems at the time of death. Now, they were never able to find out the exact level of intoxication, and to my knowledge, there was never any reports of them acting like drunk and belligerent on the hiking trail, so it's likely that they only had a small amount to drink. However, cliffs, selfies, and alcohol do not mix and the couple tragically lost their lives as a result. And there's one more incredibly bizarre and creepy twist to this story. When Sean Madison and his girlfriend learned about the fates of the Indian couple, they began looking through the photos that they had taken that day at Taft Point. And in a very disturbing coincidence, they realized that they had inadvertently captured photos with Morthy in the background. She really stood out due to her pink hair. These photos would prove to be her last. May her and her husband rest in peace. And guys, please be careful when you're trying to get that epic photo op in the mountains. And speaking of epic photos, that is a great description of the ones that I'm about to show you next. And to be clear, these photos are epic, but that does not change the fact that they're incredibly disturbing. On September 27th, 2014, a few hundred people in Japan set out to climb Mount Ontake. And tragically, over 50 of them would not return home. And that's because just before noon local time, the mountain violently erupted. One of the men standing on the summit at the time was Izumi Noguchi, who had this photo of him snapped literally just before the eruption. This would prove to be the last photo of Noguchi, but not the last photo that he took. Upon hearing, seeing, and probably feeling the eruption, he pointed his lens at these thick plumes of ash that would soon engulf the summit of the mountain. It's unlikely that Noguchi survived long after these photos were taken. His images, however, did survive. His camera was battered, but the memory card still worked, and so his final moments were able to be shared with the world. In reference to the last photo on the memory card, his wife said, quote, this is an amazing photo, but I wish he had fled instead of taking pictures I'd rather have him back. There were other hikers on the summit at the time, and at least one more of them unknowingly had their last photo taken. This photo of Hideomi Takahashi was taken just four minutes before the eruption and shows the man posing, but not quite smiling. It's almost as if he knew something very bad was about to happen. The Mount Ontake eruption is still the deadliest eruption in Japan since 1902. May Naguchi, Takahashi, and all of the other hikers who died that day rest in peace. This next photo really gets me. It's incredibly disturbing because honestly of how happy everyone looks in it. The people in this photo had no idea that this photo would be the last one of all seven of them. On September 14th, 2015, seven hikers in their 50s set out into Keyhole Canyon in Utah's Zion National Park. The group, who had all met through the Valencia Hiking Club, had spent months planning their adventure. Several of them were already experienced hikers and all but one of them had taken a five-hour canyoneering class the same day as their adventure. They needed a permit for Keyhole Canyon and when they received it, park rangers had actually warned them about the risks involved with what they were about to do. There was a 40% chance of rain that day and the canyon could potentially flood with water. However, it's unclear to me if this was like a serious specific warning to the group or if it was just like a generic warning that was given along with every permit that was issued. I'm not really sure because obviously those would be two different circumstances. But regardless, it does appear that the group was keeping a close eye on the forecast. Multiple members of the group called or texted their family members asking for weather updates as they entered the park, but unfortunate timing resulted in them not receiving a proper warning about the danger that they were headed into. Shortly after the group lost cell service, I'm talking just a matter of minutes, a flash flood warning was issued for the area around Keyhole Canyon. The park service promptly closed the canyon, but there was no way for the hikers to have known this. The group was about to hike right into a death trap and 
they didn't even know it. The beginning of their hike in the canyon went according to plan, and at one point they all paused to snap this photo. It's a beautiful photo showing vibrant and smiling faces, but knowing what happened next makes it incredibly disturbing. After this photo was taken, from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m., heavy rain poured down and Keyhole Canyon began to flash flood. At one point, a smaller group of hikers had actually passed this group and they managed to make it out of the canyon just before it flooded. They reported to park rangers that the larger group was likely stuck in the canyon and rangers were able to confirm this when they located the group's vehicles. Unfortunately, for the rest of the day, conditions in the canyon were just too dangerous for them to launch a rescue. All seven hikers in this photo perished in Keyhole Canyon. Over the next several days, searchers recovered their bodies one by one, each of them having been flooded out to a different part of the canyon or various drainages in the area. Their names were Steve Arthur, Gary Favela, Muku Reynolds, Don Teichner, Robin Brum, Mark McKenzie, and Linda Arthur. I've never done any canyoneering myself, so it's hard for me to extract any lessons from this sad story. So if you're familiar with it and you're familiar with canyoneering and you wanna share some takeaways for all of us, please do so in the comments. And if you're one of the people that made it this far into the video, I ask once again that you please hit that subscribe button and help me get closer to my goal of 1 million subscribers. But honestly, more importantly, please keep all the victims that I talked about in this video in your hearts and please stay safe out there. Thank you for watching everybody.